and welcome to a cup of tea with Stephen. Thank you from my mug from Pam Sherrick. Uh, love it. Anyway, before we start today, let's give a big shout out to our footballer boys. They were amazing. What a job. And they made us so proud. What incredible guys. What hasn't made us so proud is the hate and racism has raised its head. You know, no one is born a racist. We're all born equal and you learn to be a racist or a hater uh, only by starting at the right at the core and teaching people that not to hate is the only way forward. I belong to a group called Diversity Role Models that go into schools and talk about LGBTQ, telling us stories, inspiring, and trying to eliminate some of that hate. And anytime you say something to a child about another person uh, that's negative, you, you're, you're in embedding that in them and they'll take it into the later life. Uh, please, let's all start from the core and say positive. Anyway, moving on from that, my guest today is one of Britain's best crime writers. Uh, you might not know her face, or rather her, really famous, but I can't wait to introduce you to this lady. She's quite incredible. It's Hilary Bonner. <laughs> Hi, Hilary, how are you? Hi, Stephen, I'm well, thank you. Better than I deserve. Where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm in Somerset, oh. looking out over the Black Down Hills on a lovely, lovely day. About time we had a few lovely days. Anyway, so listen, you've been so busy during your lockdown. Uh, tell us all the things you've been up to. Well, uh, I sort of finished one book and wrote another. Uh, and uh, probably most exciting of all, uh, I signed a contract for my first play, thriller called Dead Lies, yeah. which... Uh, it was a bit on and off because of COVID um, and is now scheduled to open on September the 14th and go on a nationwide tour. Just, can you tell us a little bit what Dead Lies is about? I know it's got Harriet Thorpe, who we had on the show uh, last thought, month. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's, um, it, it, it's, it, it's a political thriller uh, inspired by the Jeremy Thorpe case and set in Barnstable, which is in the area of North Devon where I was born and brought up. Uh, and it's being premiered in Barnstable on September the, uh, the 14th. And it's about a, 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 a politician inspired by Thorpe who's been uh, welcomed by the country as a kind of messiah. But yeah. he has or does he a dark secret in his past and what would he do to um, to overcome this. And it also stars in it, the man playing Peter George is Clive Mantle, Ga Game of Thrones and um, uh, uh, Casualty and Holby City. Uh, and we have uh, John Lyons, who of course was uh, David Jason's sidekick in Touch of Frost. And we have Kimberly Wyatt, who, a pretty cat doll, uh, who we were, were <laughs> staggered, who, who wanted to really do straight stage acting acting and came in an audition because she is not known in that area and yeah. she has she was brilliant she plays the part of a sort of alistair campbell dominic uh, cummings type character but you know, Hillary, every you know during lockdown everyone's been writing a book i mean yeah. how many people have you had saying i'm writing a book and then, and you know I, I don't know if you know this but a 90 uh, so i say but nine percent of the world say they're going to write a book <laughs> right and only seven percent start and only 5% finish, even though there's lots of books out there. So it's quite, quite, a, quite, quite a, you know, a feat to write a book. But people are under the illusion that you write a book, it becomes a bestseller, it becomes a movie and you make a fortune. But that isn't always the case, is it? <laughs> I should think not. <laughs> and it's uh, also, even the writing it, as you rightly say, I think maybe more people, do, I don't know. Uh, I know a few journalists who did during lockdown, but there's a, there's a, there's a wonderful old, old apocryphal uh, story which we writers like, which is the writer and the brain surgeon meet at a party and they ask each other what they, what they do, do for a living. Uh, and the writer says, well, he's a writer and the brain surgeon says, uh, oh really, how fascinating. When I retire, I'm going to be a writer. And the writer says, yes, that really is fascinating because when I retire, I'm going to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> you come from the old school, you're a proper journalist. Uh, from Fleet Street days, you would never guess it. Could you? Is that, is that still a <laughs> These are one of the sweetest people you could meet. <laughs> but how do you think journalism has changed over the years, uh, uh, Hilary? Well, it's changed beyond recognition. Um, 
some of it, I suppose, is the fault of people who were in newspapers. I, I certainly thought, you know, phone hacking and all of that was disgraceful. However, I think there's an element of um, a dying species fighting for survival. Um, funnily enough, books seem to be going for, from strength to strength because uh, people are reading them online and a lot of people are going back to reading yeah. uh, hard copy books. Newspapers are different. I mean, the majority of people don't take them anymore. When I, well, when I joined the, the, da the Daily Mirror, which was the, the last paper I, I, I wrote work for as a staff person, I joined it in uh, the early 80s and we had a circulation of about three and a half million, I think, and it had beat a four. It had yep. been much more at its absolute peak. I understand now the circulation of the uh, hard copy newspaper is about 300,000, yeah, yeah. 400,000. Um, it can't be the same. I mean, uh, we were very privileged people. We jetted around the world first class and, and you know, money was really yeah. no option as long as you got the story. I remember my friend Lester Middlehurst, who was a friend of yours as well, bless his soul, talking about being in Cafe Pacific with you, uh, flying, I think, to Hong Kong, or was it? I'm not quite sure. And uh, playing, uh, uh, playing a game backgammon with you all the way and and I, I remember bumping into you uh, at uh, Madame Tussauds at the Bills the first time I ever met you at the Bill and Lester go oh my god sorry Bob she, she's quite frightening you know <laughs> I had you up, up here uh, but uh, it was quite a glamorous time and uh, Lester's uh, Spence accounts with his Kia Royale so for clients and stuff now you can't get a sandwich for some of the celebrities well are no really and uh, uh, I mean I think everybody goes to the canteen for lunch and, and <laughs> <laughs> but there was, a, of course, a much more uh, serious uh, side of it. Um, yeah. um, we need a strong press. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Any democracy needs a strong press, and we are losing our press. Yeah. Uh, and, and the people who are writing uh, about our leaders and our celebrities and so on are largely unaccountable now online, uh, which, I, which I think is terrifying. The news of the world was a very, very important newspaper, which people forget. I mean, no, no, never mind the sort of sex exposés and the premiership footballers and so on. Uh, the News of the World was pretty much the sort of watchdog of the, of the nation. And if we had something like the Dominic Cummings affair in the days of the News of the World, we'd all have been waiting for Sunday and they would have had the real story and they would have told us. And there is, I don't think there's anybody in the country powerful enough in the media to do that anymore. But we're in a society where we're worried about bullying, racism, hate. Now, what responsibility do you think the columnists on a Wednesday have? Now, I'll give you an example here. <clears throat> Here's one columnist. Supermodel Cara Devine's 45 million family property company, of which she is a director, has taken a government cash to furlough staff, earning 15 million last year alone. She should hang her head in shame Furlough was meant for the needy, not desperately needing attention seekers. Now, first of all, Cara is a director, as many people, and many companies furloughed staff with a lot more equity in them. Next thing, Cara is an actress, right, and a model, and isn't needy. She doesn't do photo shoots to get attention for herself. She works. So what do you think of this comment from one of the, one of the Wednesday ladies? Uh, do you think there's not a response? This is one of many hate comments towards the models etc. Is this something that we should be looking at, uh, uh, and, you know, or, uh, is it something should we should be cutting out? Well, Stephen, uh, you don't become a columnist by being reasonable. <laughs> uh, now, Linda Lee Potter, for example, was a really good friend of mine, and I love Linda, but her column repeatedly made me cringe. Well, of course, when you got together with a lovely Amanda Barry and you have a, have a gorgeous marriage to her, you both always look so happy together, which is, is nice. It was, it was quite big. It's a miracle. Big, big, it's big, big news. How did you both meet? Oh, well, um, we met uh, originally when uh, I interviewed her for Coronation Street and I was on the, uh, uh, on the mirror. Uh, and a lovely man called Peter Mares, who uh, was the press officer who I got on with very well, 
we 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 believed in trying to do big good stories that were good for him and good for me yeah and uh, he suggested i might like to interview amanda who he'd been sitting next to at a at some granada do uh he said as long as you can avoid a certain subject because at that time that was vaguely known in fleet street uh, what amanda's sexual preferences were um it, it, she didn't talk about it and she didn't give interviews either so i so he then told me that she'd basically that she'd been a Soho showgirl and run away from home when she was 13 and sort of had known all the gangsters and lived in the West End as a very young girl and so on and so on. Uh, and I said, oh, I can do that. So I went to interview her and I got a three part series out of it. Uh, she was quite impressed. And then we did another thing. And she's a great horse racing woman. I took her to see uh, a retired, of course, Red Rum on Grand National Day. Uh, and then I didn't hear from her for, well, we weren't in touch, we'd like for 10 years. And uh, she rang me up when she was leaving Corrie because she wanted to place the story. She wasn't um, happy with the way she was being written out. She wasn't happy with the way the cancer storyline yeah. was uh, going. And she said, um, uh, I was trying to think of a journalist I could trust. Um, and she was talking about, and I said, sorry, Amanda, I have to go. Um, the living room chimney is on fire, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. But then I called back and then I handled that and we did a, a big series for the sun and we did the book. And along the way, I saw the light, as it were. Hello, you, you're, um, you're, you're also a, a great interviewer yourself. You've inter apart from Amanda, you've, you've interviewed countless celebrities, including Emmanuel, uh, Sylvia Crystal in Paris. Uh, and uh, uh, you haven't got, ever thought of going into erotic fiction yourself, have you? Ah, Stephen, you obviously haven't read my first book. Oh, didn't no, I have read most of them, but... <laughs> my first book was called The Cruelty of Morning. I was very lucky. It was published by Heinemann. Heinemann. Yeah. It was a thriller, well, uh, although I didn't really know that. They told me uh, this will go into the crime genre, and I said, oh, good, yes. Uh, but um, it was, uh, uh, it, it, well, I'll tell you how erotic it was. I was the first author, apparently, first first time author in the history of Heinemann to be asked to tone the sex down. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. Did you, and, and my first few books were pretty horny, actually, but uh, I can't remember what it's like now, so I've cut it all out. <laughs> no, but you've got that, now the scene, the, the sex genre is very popular. Like, uh, you've got Fifty Shades, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, Fifty uh, Shades uh, in your heart out. Yeah, uh, uh, the of morning. Just, you must read The Cruelty of Morning. I'd be very I interested. Must admit, I must have missed that one. Ap apologies. Um, Number one. Do you, do you think there's pretty... too much sex in the media, though? Um, I don't see Netflix, Netflix, Netflix best-selling show Sex. That's so. No, uh, I watch a lot of Netflix. That's uh, appalling, but I, I'm going to tell you it's actually laughable. But well, uh, what gets me? And uh, Amanda just switches it on for a laugh. I, I virtually I have to walk out the room. It's naked attraction. Oh my god, it's brilliant. <laughs> everybody I know, everybody, uh, Hillary, everyone says to me, I'm I'm not watched that, and I go okay, but. The bit I did, uh, and 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 then you think, and I'm like, hang on a minute, no, no, just no, a bit, just the whole show you're talking about. I think it's it's just got everyone, uh, everyone caught in the headlights when they start to watch that. But who are some of the favourite people you've interviewed? Well, as you rightly say, there's a there's a long list, and and a lot of them are, uh, uh, go back to an era when you know your viewers um, might not even remember them. Maybe they would, but I was lucky enough to. I just caught the end of an era of some real greats and I interviewed Betty Davis and... Oh, did you? Yeah, and oh, James Stewart. Um, and okay, you just can't say that word to LGBTQ, Betty Davis, and just skip. What was she like? <laughs> I'd be killed. What was, so you can't say the word Betty Davis in an LGBTQ interview without stopping for a second. Tell oh, right. a little bit about Betty Davis. Well, she was, she was wonderful. She was wonderful to me. Um, uh, I interviewed at the Deauville Film Festival, where they, they used to do, they probably still do, uh, retrospectives of the, the great stars. And I, 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 inter I was lucky enough to interview um, uh, more, more than one of them. Um, uh, I mean, the last thing she needed or, or was to be interviewed by me, but she agreed to do it. And she was very, very generous. Um, 
I should have looked out the interview really because I don't remember the details of it, but I, 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 I was overwhelmed to have met her. I am a, now Voyager. We have the stars, Jerry. Don't ask for the moon. I mean, oh my oh god. Oh my god. Oh god, that's uh, that, that, that's brilliant. That's obviously amazing. Yeah. When you listen, when you're writing books, do you have actors in mind? Do you see them see them playing parts? Is there any no. actors? You don't no. never. No, I write when I'm writing a book, it's just the story. And when I was, it's just a story, the story, everything is story led for me. Well, character led too, but the, the, the fictional characters. Uh, when, when I did the, the uh, wrote the play, I sort of tried to think of people. And, and in fact, the producer then had a particular actor in mind for the lead. And when that yeah. went wrong, that was partly why it didn't, didn't go ahead. Um, I find it difficult. I, I was though, um, the producers asked me if I'd like to be, and I said, Yes, I think I would. I was very involved with the um, the casting process okay. for, for for Dead Live. Yeah. Uh, um, we you know, virtually well, everybody was asked to come and meet us. Uh, it's a big cast for for a touring play. So yeah, it is a really good, really so good that cast. Means it, um, it ain't cheap, uh, and. Uh, so we had to be very careful with the casting. We're thrilled with the cast we've got. What do you think of it, Russell T. Davis is a brilliant writer, we have to say, yeah. first of all, yeah. and saying that only gay people should play gay characters? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, how can, I, I, I don't agree. I, 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 I don't see how you can say that. They, they're actors. It shouldn't be gay people. It's actors. And, and if, you, if you say that, then you have to turn it around. Uh, and and say that um, uh, gay actors can't play straight people. Yeah. I don't know what Ian McKellen and so on would think of that. We'd certainly lose some great performance. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really, um, I mean, we've got, um, I don't know if you watch Corrie, but we've got Tony Maudsley, who, you know, famously Benidorm, the gay hairdresser. Yes. He's playing a, a, a straight role in uh, Coronation Street. Uh, and he's doing it absolutely brilliantly. I mean, he, he, and he is quite, quite camp, bless him. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> for goodness sake. And a first-class actor with a first-class... Do I mean, I you know I love them? Benadol's my guilty pleasure. Uh, uh, I put it on when I'm... Going, I'm going back to that, the other thing is, you know, actually, funny enough, somebody asked Amanda that the other day, and she said this, you know, do you have to be a murderer to... Um, uh, to, to, to play a murderer, you know, it, 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 if you take it to the extreme, it becomes uh, it becomes ridiculous. In the days when my books did have quite a lot of sex in them, people used to ask me about the uh, uh, about my own sexual activities, the cheeky devil sometimes, and <laughs> uh, uh, I I used to sort of sidetrack it by saying, well, you know, there are quite a lot of murders in my books too, and do you know what? I haven't murdered anybody for ages. Uh, it's very interesting when you do write something, people go, oh, have you done that? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, but I have spoken to someone who has or, or researched it or, or, or something. So you live in the heart of London and obviously it's, it's your, your main home really, isn't it? Uh, yeah. What is it you love most about the capital city? Well, I, I absolutely love the, the buzz of London and I, and I think the people, because people congregate in London, so many interesting people are around you all the time. And it's the centre, it's the centre of, of, of the country and there's, it's great to be at the centre. It is still quite sad to be, you know, we are in Covent Garden and it is quite sad at the moment because the theatres aren't open. Mm -hmm. And if you're in Covent Garden and the theatres aren't open, not only is it tragic that they're not open, but it's, it's so sad for so many other people. Uh, uh, you mentioned Joe Allen earlier. Joanna hasn't reopened. I hope to God it does. Come back, Joe's in issue. Um, uh, 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 and and so it's rather sad. Um, jo but, Joe's Amanda's mothership, really, isn't it? Well, it, it, yes, we call we call it our canteen. It's very rude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we I, I, I hadn't realised, I, I, you know, I went, I went for lunch lunch yesterday and a lady I was having lunch with, I saw she was saying, I said, no, let's sit indoors. I haven't been indoors in ages. Going <laughs> <laughs> back to what, what um, I love in, our, uh, in, um, in London is going to the theatre and what, what we've, uh, I'm, I'm also, I'm a member of the uh, Ivy Club and they do these wonderful theatre nights where you yeah. have a package and you go and see uh, often one that's quite hard to get into a, a play or a show and then you have supper afterwards at the ivy and that is just one of my favorite things and of course it hasn't happened for a long time so london isn't quite there 
Is that what would, would, you, would you say that was your perfect evening? What would your perfect evening? Oh be? yes, it probably it probably is. And what makes you smile most? Yes, most of it. I think. Well, golly, what makes me smile most? Probably my dog. I should say Amanda. <laughs> Hello. Oh, I've been. Well, Sorry about the delay, you may have to do uh, some cuts. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Hilary, that's made us smile and you've made us smile today. Thank you ever so much for being on the show. You've been incredible. Sorry about the dog delay. Oh, we love it. We love the dog. Thank you so much. Lots of love. <laughs>